good stuff in here in chapter nine. Um, we are going to get into some of the classification processes and how we classify the synovial joints. As you recall, synovial joints are joint that have a, a, a joint cavity that's filled with fluid surrounded by a capsule. And they fall under the functional classification of a diarthrosis. Those are highly mo mobile joints or movable joints. So in this situation, when we classify our synovial joints, we are going to talk about the movements that they make and the shapes of the joint surfaces. Those are the two ways that we classify the, move, uh, the, the synovial joints, by the movements that they make and the shapes of the joint surfaces. So the first one here, when we're talking about the types of movement that they make, we have uniaxial, biaxial, multiaxial. I'm assuming that you can figure that out. Okay, uni is one, bi is two, multi is many. Right, so when we're talking about the movement for the bones here in an uniaxial joint, that means that, that bone is going to move through just one plane or one axis. Biaxial is going to be through two planes or axes. And then multi is going to obviously be multiple planes or axes. When we talk about the axes, we're talking about the X, Y, Z axis plane. I remember in math when you were having to do the graphing, that's what we're talking about. And when we're talking about the planes, it'll be the coronal plane, okay, our sagittal plane, our transverse plane, oblique planes. That's what we're talking about when we're discussing um, the types uh, of movement planes. So when we're classifying the synovial joints based on their shape, right, you have a list here. The top of the list, the plane joints are going to be the least mobile. And then we're going to start to, as we go down the list, increase in mobility as we get to the bottom. And we'll see that the ball and socket joints are the most mobile. So we're going to hit up all of these. We're going to talk about each one of these individually. So when we're talking about a plane joint, you look at the word plane, think flat. Right, so the articular surfaces are going to be flat. Right? One type of plane joint is going to be the sacroiliac joint. Those are relatively flat planes there. Okay, the auricular surface of both the um, uh, the sacrum and the auricular surface of the os coxa. Okay, so it's limited. Right, you're going to see either side to side gliding movement in a, in, in a single plane, back and forth, that sort of thing. So when we talk about it, it's a uniaxial movement. The next type of joint is a hinge joint. Pretty, pretty familiar with that. Okay, think of a hinge of a door. All right, again, we will fall under a uniaxial type of movement. A pivot joint, right? We saw the pivot joint when we were talking about supination and pronation, how the, the, the radius pivots over on top of the ulna when you go into pronation. So again, we're going to see, right, one end of the bone, and that was the uh, capitulum of the humerus, had a rounded kind of surface. And then we had our, um, um, the head of the uh, radius there would sit right on top of that. And it would rotate around that area there, that capitulum, and give us that pronation supination there. Condylar joints, okay, this is a biaxial, so you'll have many movement planes. I shouldn't say many, you'll have two movement planes or axes, right? And usually when we're dealing with a condylar joint, you're gonna have one surface is gonna be oval and the other one is gonna be convex. It fits right in. Similar to um, the atlantal axial joint, um, excuse me, the atlanto occipital joint, that's where the axis, or excuse me, my gosh, my brain is not working tonight. The atlas, C1, articulates, because it has the lateral masses there, articulate with the occipital condyles on the base of the occipital bone. Sh uh, saddle joint, just like it is in the name, it's a, a saddle-shaped joint. So you'll have one surface that's convex, the other one's concave. And it'll almost look like you're placing two saddles against one another. That's also a biaxial. And finally, our ball and socket is the most mobile. Okay, it's multi-axial, so it moves through all the different planes there. And this is the most freely mobile type of joint. Now, we already talked about uh, the gliding motion. Okay, you're going to see two surfaces that will slide back and forth or side to side on one another. All right, very limited amount of movement there. So that means that these types of joints 
are very stable joints. When you have limited movement, okay? Remember that uh, inverse relationship that we saw, more mobility means less stability and vice versa. So we'll see these type of joints in our wrists and the carpal bones, those are short bones. And so those bones will glide past one another. And we'll also see it in the tarsal bones. We'll talk more about the tarsal bones today um, as we complete the lower extremity in the appendicular skeleton. This is a great figure in your book. Uh, unfortunately, it did not transition well over into my PowerPoint because you can't really read any of the text on here. But it goes through and it shows you all these different joints throughout your body and examples for them. So I suggest that you take a peek at it when you get the, sh when you get the chance to see what you think. All right, so the movements for synovial joints, right? We have our four types. We just talked about gliding, right? We have angular, rotational, and then of course, special movements, which just don't really fit into anywhere. So we give them their own special category. So we already talked about the gliding. Let's talk about the angular motion. And so when we're talking about angular motion, we're gonna be using two bones, right? And basically we're gonna describe what happens when we increase or decrease, all right, the angle size between the two bones. So you see here, we have a whole list, flexion, extension, hyperextension, lateral flexion, abduction, and adduction, and circumduction. So I'm gonna go through all these with you to kind of give you a little bit of a, a better understanding here. So you'll, you'll understand when I'm saying, oh, this is what happens when you flex the uh, elbow joint and whatnot. So when we're dealing with flexion, right, this type of movement is gonna move through the anterior posterior plane, that's front to back. Right? And so what will happen is if you have two bones in this joint, you are going to bring one bone closer to the other bone. So therefore that decreases the angle between the bones. Now the example there is bending the finger. I like to use the example of bending your elbow. Right? You wanna bring a cup to your mouth to drink, you have to bend your elbow amongst other things. Okay, But that's what happens during flexion. Extension is the opposite. Okay, So now what you're gonna do is you are going to increase the angle between the two bones there. Again, this happens in the anterior posterior plane, so we'll call that the A to P plane. And so again, the example listed here is when you made a fist, you go to open your hand up to maybe shake somebody's hand, you are extending the fingers. Or after you've taken that drink from your cup and you wanna go set it down, you have to extend your elbow and straighten it out somewhat. And therefore you move the bones away from each other in the elbow joint. Flexion and extension. Now the next one is a little bit harder to understand the hyperextension. Keep in mind, the definition as stated is when you extend a joint more than 180 degrees. So that would be like me straightening my elbow out past, all right, 180 degrees. I'm going past that point, all right? So in some cases, all right, we'll see when we're describing hyperextension, we're moving the joint beyond its normal range of motion. And that could be kind of scary because when you move it past the normal range of motion, there's always that possibility for injury. So sometimes you'll hear that term hyperextended. I hyperextended my knee. And so that is one way that you can use the term hyperextension, right? But another way is when you extend the joint more than 180 degrees, so usually we like to use the example of when you're in the anatomical position, your head is looking straight down, uh, excuse me, straight forward. So when you ask somebody, okay, flex your neck, okay, basically saying, all right, look down towards the floor. When you flex the neck and you look down towards the floor, that is called cervical flexion because the cervical spine, that's the spine in your neck is flexing forward. You are approximating you're bringing the vertebrae in the cervical spine closer to the vertebrae in the thoracic spine as you look down towards the floor. All right, so then when you say to that same person, okay, now go ahead and look straight ahead again. Now you're moving that, that head and neck into extension because now 
you are moving the vertebra, the cervical vertebra in your neck away from the, the thoracic vertebra in your spine. I'll show you a picture and I'll tell you what I mean by that. Then when you ask that same person, okay, now you're looking straight ahead. Now I want you to look up towards the ceiling. Now you're bending, right, the cervical uh, spine, neck, all right, past 180 degrees. I'll show you how to picture here and maybe that'll help you a little bit. And that brings me to lateral flexion. All right, when we're talking about lateral flexion, we're gonna be dealing with parts of your body moving within the coronal plane. So we usually use this terminology when we're talking about the cervical and lumbar regions of your spine, but we'll say, all right, take your hands, put them to your sides, and now I want you to lean to the right as far as you can, just at your waist. And so you slide your hand down towards your knee, and that would be right lateral flexion. And then I say, okay, straighten back up. Now take your left hand and run it down your leg towards your knee and bend at your waist to the left as far as you can. And then as you're leaning to the left, you're engaging in left lumbar lateral flexion. So here's that first one I was telling you about. When your spine is straight up and down like this, okay, the cervical spine is at 180 degrees. That's a 180 degree angle right there. So when you go to bend your neck and look down at the floor, here's the thoracic spine. Now the cervical spine has this angle here. So now it's much smaller, about 60 degrees. Okay, then I said, all right, go ahead and straighten your head up, all right? Look straight forward again. Now you're back to that 180 degrees. You move the cervical spine away from the thoracic spine. Then I say to you, okay, look up towards the ceiling. Now we've extended the cervical spine more than 180 degrees. So that is how we're determining Flexion, extension, and hyperextension really in the neck. Some of you may have taken a smart book uh, um, assignment here and you may have seen this. All right, then you can see flexion and extension in the elbow, pretty easy. Bring your uh, fist towards your shoulder. All right, that is going to be flexion. Okay, straighten your arm out, that is extension. Similar to the wrist here, you see we have our flexion, extension, and hyperextension. Okay, so when your hand is in this neutral position here and you bring your palm towards your forearm, all right, that's gonna be flexion because now it's only about 60 degrees here. Then when you return it back to its original position, that's extension. You move the bones away from each other. And then when you go back into hyperextension with the wrist, now we have about 100, it's greater than 180 degrees. All right, so here you can see a nice example of the lateral flexion at the lumbar spine. You're just leaning side to side. You're moving within the coronal plane. All right, abduction and adduction. When you abduct somebody, if you read in the news somewhere, all right, that so-and-so, all right, um, Demi Lovato, I don't know why that name popped in my head, but for whatever reason, she's been abducted. Okay, and she hasn't been heard from for two days. Okay, she last reported being dragged off, thrown in a van and driven away. She's abducted. So we've taken her away from somewhere. Okay, so that's what happens with abduction. What we're going to do, whatever body part that we're talking about, we're going to move that away from something. And in this case, it'll be the midline. And it depends on what the midline is. And I'll go into that. Midline could be your middle finger in your hand or your spine in your trunk, right? So what we'll see is for the example of the arm, right? When I ask you to abduct your arm, your arms are down to your side. All you're gonna do is just raise your arms straight out away from your body. And that's abduction of the shoulder. So then I say, all right, that's great. Your arms are straight out to your sides. Now bring them back down to your side. So when you do that, you are undergoing adduction. You are adding 
your arms back to your body, down to your sides. So we are going to see movement toward something. In this case, we'll see movement of the body part toward the midline. All right, that's abduction and adduction. So here you can see there's the lady. She's bringing her arm up and away from her trunk. That's abduction. When she brings it back down, that's adduction. At the wrist here, remember you're in the anatomical position, palm facing forward, right? When you bend your wrist toward your body, that is adding it to your midline, that's adduction. When you bend it away, that's gonna be abduction. Same thing with the leg, you move it away from the midline, abduction. Now in this case, when we're looking at the fingers, spreading your fingers apart, right, our new midline or reference point is the third finger here. So when you abduct your fingers, you're just spreading them away from each other, specifically the third finger. That's your point of reference. And then when you adduct your fingers, you're just gonna bring them all together. You're bringing them back close to the third finger there, your middle finger. Circumduction is basically, you did it probably in gym class at some point when you were in elementary school or middle school, even in high school, when your instructor said, all right, make arm circles. Let's loosen up everybody, start doing some arm circles. And so that's what you do. You started swinging your arms around. And so what we learned is the proximal end of the upper extremity during arm circles stayed relatively stationary. Not a lot of movement would go there, but the distal end you could see would make a cone like shape there. So the proximal end is relatively stationary. The distal end is going to be making that circular motion. That's circumduction. All right, then we have our rotational motion. So lots of good uh, terms in here. But basically what we're gonna see is the bone itself is gonna pivot on its own longitudinal axis. So we're gonna establish whatever the longitudinal axis is for that bone. And then we're going to establish a, a, a reference point. And I'll talk to you about that in a second. All right. And then it's going to undergo its movement. And it'll either be, if we're talking about all right, lateral or medial rotation, it'll either be turned in or turned out. So when we're talking about lateral and medial rotation, our reference point is going to be the anterior surface of that bone. Okay, so whatever the anterior surface is, if that anterior surface um, turns outwards or moves laterally, then that's lateral rotation. If that anterior surface turns inward, all right, or medially, that's medial rotation. I'll show you some examples here. But always remember, we're gonna use the anterior surface of the bone. All right, pronation and supination, that's gonna um, be for the forearm. We talked about that before. So when you are in the anatomical position, your palms are facing forward. So your palms, you are in a supinated position. Right? And so when you turn your palm posterior, you undergo pronation. Okay, so our palm is going to be our reference point. So easy to remember, pronation, palm, posterior, the three Ps. And then for supination, our, our palm is going to be anterior. How I always remember that, and I talked about it in lab class, is when you bring your hands together to hold soup, okay, your palms are gonna be facing forward, okay? And so that means that your ar the uh, ulna and the radius are gonna be parallel to one another, and they're not crossing over. Pronation, the radius crosses over on top of the ulna there. So here's some examples for rotation. Okay, so actually the anterior surface would be like the vertebral bodies in your spine. And so when you turn your head from side to side, like Linda Blair hair from The Exorcist on our drawing or our picture here, what she's doing, she's doing cervical rotation. If she looks to the left, she's doing left cervical rotation. If she looks to the right, she's doing right cervical rotation. When we're talking about the arm, remember the bone is gonna, we're gonna be moving it along its longitudinal axis. All right, well, the front of the bone is basically gonna be where the bicep is right here. So when you turn the bicep out, okay, and that anterior surface is pointing laterally, that's lateral rotation, All right? When you turn the uh, arm in, that bicep is turning in, 
okay? That is gonna be medial rotation. And when we're dealing here with the leg, just use the shin. There's the anterior surface right, of the bone is the shin. So if you turn your feet out, the shin turns out, that's lateral rotation. If you turn your feet in, right, the shin will turn inwards, that'll be medial rotation. Pronation, supination, like I said, palm posterior pronation. So when you're in the anatomical position, you are in the supinated position, palm is facing forward, the forearm, uh, the forearm bones, the ulna and the radia are parallel to one another. When you go into pronation, you turn the palm posterior, that is going to then cause the radius to uh, cross over on top of the ulna. All right, special movements. These we can't classify in our other categories. So let's talk about these special movements, depression and elevation, easy to remember. Okay, when we're dealing with depression, we're going to be talking about movement of the body part downwards. So if we talk about the mandible, that's the only movable bone in your skull. When you open your mouth, you are depressing the mandible. You're moving it inferiorly. When you close your mouth, okay, you are raising the mandible superiorly, and that's going to be elevation. So we can use depression and elevation in other areas. How about the shoulders there? Okay, when you add, I get this all the time from my kids, right? Why is this mess here? I don't know. And they raise their uh, shoulders up, right? So they're doing elevation. They're when you shrug your shoulders up towards your ears, that's elevation. And then when you push them down, that's depression, okay? Elevation, depression. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion are pretty much going to be, the only place you're going to find that is going to be in the ankle joint, also known as the tallow curl joint. And our reference point for this is going to be the top of your foot, also known as the dorsum of the foot. All right, so what you're going to see is when you bring the top of your foot close to your shin, okay, that is going to be dorsiflexion. You're moving the dorsum of your foot towards the anterior surface or closer to your leg. All right, when you actually point your toes down towards the floor, right, then you're gonna see the dorsum of the foot moving away from the tibia or your leg, and it's gonna point inferiorly. Like when I ask you to get up onto your tiptoes, if you're too short and you can't look over something, you, when you're getting up on your tiptoes, you are undergoing plantar flexion. I always remember that I'm planting my foot when I go. I used to play basketball, wasn't very good. Even though I know when you folks look at me, you think stellar athletes must have been all American in every sport that he ever participated in. I have to be humble and tell you no, that wasn't the case. But I always remember my basketball coach telling me when we were going to make layoffs, you know, plant your foot and jump. And when you did that, right, you were, we were undergoing plantar flexion. Eversion and inversion, again, we usually use this term in the foot, and then it has to do with the sole of the foot. So when you are undergoing eversion, you are turning your sole outward or laterally. When you're undergoing inversion, you are turning the sole medially. By the way, this type of position is the most common type of ankle sprain. All right, so you can have inverted ankle sprains and everted ankle sprains. And most commonly, the inversion ankle sprains are going to be seen more often. So eversion and inversion has to do with the sole of your foot, turning it in or turning it out. Protraction and retraction. Again, what we're dealing with is going to be anterior movements from always the anatomic position. So when you're protracting your jaw, you're pushing your jaw forward. Right, when we're talking about retraction of the jaw, okay, you are going to be moving that same structure posteriorly. This always made me remember I was a freshman at the Citadel. The Citadel is a military college in Charleston, South Carolina, for those of you that don't know that. And at the time when I went there, it was all male. 
And so we had to undergo my freshman year, they called us knobs. And that is what a freshman is called because you shave your head and you look like a doorknob. Well, anyways, we had to be put into a position they call the brace. And essentially what you do is you stand in the anatomic position, you bring your hands to your side, you roll your shoulders back as far as you can. You try to pinch your shoulder blades together. While you're doing that, you have to look straight ahead and you have to pull your head as far back as you can. And at the same time, you have to retract your jaw, the mandible. So you're pulling your jaw as far back as you can. So when I look at this picture, it always brings back memories of that. If anybody is familiar with the Boy Scouts, you'll see here a picture of somebody's um, left hand and they they're actually doing the Boy Scout salute. But actually when you're doing this type of configuration, you are undergoing opposition of the thumb. You are bringing the thumb, all right, over towards the pinky. So what we're seeing here when the pinky and the thumb are approximating with one another, that's opposition. And then when you go to return the pinky and the thumb back to the original places, the thumb has undergone reposition. <laughs> Rebecca, the Citadel was a love-hate relationship. I did not like it very much when I was there, especially on a Friday night when all my friends were off going out, going to the movies and, and having fun. And I was staying in and, and uh, shining shoes and doing all sorts of things, but it was good for me. If I had gone to uh, a non-military school, it probably would have taken me many, many, many years to graduate. I'm going to the Citadel, I was forced to graduate in four, which was a good thing. I liked to socialize, let's just say that, when I was very young. All right, the temporal mandibular joints. We're going to start now. We've gone through all the movements and all that. Now we're going to talk about specific joints for the rest of the class here. And so let's talk about the temporal mandibular joint, an often popular joint because you often hear people talk about TMJ, which we'll talk about in a second here. So with the temporal mandibular joint, we're going to be do dealing with the mandibular condyle there. And I live in Charleston. Yeah, well, actually, the first female graduate from the Citadel, Nancy Mace, is the representative uh, for the state of South Carolina, not for the state of South Carolina, excuse me, for, I believe, the first district of uh, South Carolina down there in the low country. And so she is uh, the first female graduate. And yeah, I mean, it's tough. Citadel is no joke, no joke. Um, but like I said, actually, I'll be celebrating my 25th college reunion this year. <laughs> Crazy. So the head of the mandible is going to articulate with the temporal bone and the mandibular fossa. We talked about that before, but the nice thing about this joint is one, okay, it, it's, a, it's a capsular joint, so you have that joint surrounded by uh, an articular capsule, but inside of that joint we have an articular disc. So our discs, as we talked about before, our fibrocartilage, right, that tough compression resistant cartilage. And so the nice thing about it is this disc will actually divide the synovial cavity into two separate chambers from one another. So I'll show you this in a second here in the next picture. All right, but we have two uh, ligaments that we need to know. We have the sphenomandibular ligament, okay? And that's going to, and if you look at the word sphenomandibular, it tells you where this ligament goes to and where it comes from, okay? So it's going to be attaching the sphenoid bone to the mandible. Our other uh, ligament is gonna be the temporal mandibular joint. And so the temporal mandibular joint is going to attach, all right, the mandible here onto the temporal bone. And you have this bump on the temporal bone there. So primarily the, the, the uh, temporal mandibular joint is a hinged joint. Open the mouth, close the mouth, right? But if you know 
Okay, you have molars for a purpose and those molars are to grind food. So with that, you need to have a little bit of side to side movement going on. So we'll have hinge movements, we'll have some gliding movement side to side, and we'll even have some pivotal movement too, right? Because we have all those different motions that can occur, right? Depression, elevation, retraction, protraction, and then you're going to have some side to side lateral moving movement so we can grind down that food in our molars to make better work of it. So here you can see a nice close-up of that joint. And right in the middle there, there's the disc right here. Okay, so that disc is usually the problematic um, tissue or structure when you're dealing with popping or clicking in your temporal mandibular joint. I hear that all the time, quite often people will complain of that, that issue. All right, so let's talk about that issue. All right. With TMJ, you will have problems with the ligaments. And when we talk about alteration to the ligaments, usually what will happen is those ligaments have been strained. And so when you strain ligaments, there's usually a significant amount of deformation or deformity that occurs. Now, I'm not saying your jaw is gonna look all weird, right? But when you stretch, remember a ligament is made up of dense regular connective tissue. So if you overstretch it, it takes a long time and you might never go back to the original shape of that ligament here. So what happens is the ligaments, right, become compromised. They're not gonna do as good a job of securing the joint. So that will cause an issue with the disc and then we'll get with the disc a malposition or subluxation. Basically that means that that disc has been moved out of its normal position. And as a result of that, right, as the bones are moving by um, the disc, you'll have a clicking or a popping. And so most of the time that pain will be right over the joints but there's other places that that pain can radiate to, right? The paranasal sinuses, that can be anywhere along the lateral portion of your nasal cavity, right? Frontal sinuses, down by the ethmoidal sinuses, the maxillary sinuses, right? You'll also possibility having pain radiating to your eardrum, the tympanic membrane. And in some folks, they'll have pain in their mouth and their eyes. All right, let's move on to our shoulder joint. Shoulder joint is going to be made up of more than one joint. Now, typically when we talk about our shoulder joint, we think of the glenohumeral joint. That's where the humerus, that bone in our, our um, arm is gonna articulate with the scapula, right? But there's a couple joints that make up the overall shoulder joint. So one of these joints is the sternoclavicular joint. Interesting fact about the sternoclavicular joint, it's the only bony articulation between the appendicular skeleton and the axial skeleton when we're dealing with the upper extremity. And it's the only bony articulation. So the sternoclavicular joint is a saddle joint. That means you'll have one part of that joint have it a convex a uh, configuration and the other part of the joint is going to have a concave. And we talked about this joint before because the clavicle will articulate with the manubrium, that's the superior most part of our sternum there. And this joint also has an articular disc. So again, this disc is gonna divide that synovial cavity into two cavities now. And so primarily what you'll see at this joint is going to be depression and elevation, and you'll have some circumduction occurring, right? So primarily, this joint is stabilized by the fibers and the ligaments, but there's also lots of muscles around that actually help to make it even more stable. So in, essentially, this is a very stable joint, okay? So when you see that term, very stable joint, you're like, oh, all right, cool. All right, most likely this joint is not going to really get dislocated, but I know that if the joint's pretty stable, then it's not very mobile. So we don't see a tremendous amount of movement here at the sternoclavicular joint. Okay, so here you can see, here's our beautiful articular capsule. 
all right, the sternoclavicular ligament there, all right, attaching and holding the clavicle into against the manubrium here. But then as we look inside, you can see that we have our, our articular disc there that is gonna break up that synovial cavity into two smaller cavities there. All right, so that's one part of our shoulder joint. Then if we go down the clavicle all the way to where it articulates with the scapula, here's another shoulder joint. We call that the acromuloclavicular joint, also known as the AC joint. Okay, this is a plane joint. So we know you're gonna have two flat surfaces that are going to be gliding past one another. Okay, so we're gonna see again, another joint that has a disc inside of it. That's cool, okay? Same type of tissue, it's that fibrocartilaginous cartilage, which is gonna be a, a, a compression resistant, very tough form of connective tissue there. And so in this situation, we're going to see the joint capsule is going to have some help with stability from the acromioclavicular ligament. And we'll also see another ligament called the coracoclavicular ligament. Now look at the names of these two tissues here. Acromioclavicular, that means that this ligament is going to join the acromion and the acromial end of the clavicle together. And then this other ligament, the coracoclavicular ligament, is going to be uh, found coming from the coracle process all right, onto the uh, clavicle, coracoid process, all right. So if we damage specifically, all right, any one of these uh, uh, ligaments here, we can mess up the alignment of this joint and you'll see a marked distinction because one bone will be higher than the other. And we phrase that as a shoulder separation, not a shoulder dislocation, that's something else, we'll talk about that in a moment, but a shoulder separation. So that brings me to our third joint that makes up our overall shoulder joint. Now the glenohumeral joint, now if someone says, you know, my shoulder joint hurts, this is the joint that you should be thinking of, okay? But keep in mind that the other two joints that I mentioned do help to make up your shoulder. Okay, so the glenohumeral joint, this is the most mobile joint in your body. It also means it's the least stable joint. It's a ball and socket joint. Okay, so the head of the humerus is going to articulate with the scapula in the glenoid cavity there. And so what we've done is it's a relatively shallow joint. I mean, I'm not lying to you when I say this. This is going to be an exaggeration of this drawing, but that's about as shallow as the glenoid cavity gets. And so you have the head of the humerus sitting right here against it. It's pretty easy for it to come out, okay? So what has happened is, okay, we have adapted and made a little lip here and here. Now this goes all around the whole glenoid cavity. But what we do, what we have is called the glenoid labrum. And it's this fibrocartilage um, ring, like a belt that goes around the edge of the glenoid cavity and it makes it a little bit deeper. So again, it helps to try to keep the head of the humerus in there. Also, since this is the most active joint, or excuse me, the most mobile joint in your body, okay, with a lot of movement, well, that means we have to protect the tissues that are around that joint. So we add bursa sacs everywhere because bursa helps to decrease friction. And we've got tons of moving parts and pieces, muscles, tendons, all right, ligaments, all sorts of whatever in and around this joint. So we have bursa there to help reduce the friction so we're not damaging anything. Our three major ligaments, right, for this joint, all right, are gonna be the, the coracle acromial ligament, the coraco humeral ligament and the glenohumeral ligaments. And for good measure, we add in the long head of the biceps, ten, uh, biceps brachii tendon there to also help support this joint there. But really where this joint gets, right, it's stability, it's true stability from, 
is going to be from the rotator cuff muscles. Now these are four muscles and their job is to hold the head of the humerus into that glenoid cavity there. So it's really these muscles that create that stability. And so we have four muscles. These are also known as our sits muscles, okay? So when you talk about the rotator cuff muscles, we also call those the sits muscles. So it stands for supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. We'll talk about this more when we go over chapter 11, when we go over the muscles. But you should know the rotator cuff muscles and you should know what they do, okay? They help to stabilize the joint. They're actually gonna provide the majority of the stability for this joint, more so than the ligaments and the tendons there, okay? And so basically what they do is they just try to hold that head of the humerus into that very shallow glenoid cavity. So here you can see a nice picture of our glenohumeral joint. And so we see a plethora of bursa all around. Here's the, uh, the long head of the biceps brachii tendon. And then we have all these different ligaments here that actually help to make up the joint cavity for the glenohumeral joint. All right, going back to our acromioclavicular joint, you can see back up here, here's your clavicle, here's the acromion, here's the acromioclavicular ligament. If this thing gets torn, you'll have a shoulder separation, right? If either one of these ligaments can get damaged, the coracoclavicular ligament, right, that can also cause, all right, a shoulder separation. <clears throat> Here's a nice lateral picture of our joint. You can see more of the ligaments here. Here's the glenoid cavity, and you'll see the glenoid labrum right around the edge here, and that's where the head of the humerus is gonna kind of articulate with. All right, and then you have all these different tissues that help to make up the, uh, the joint capsule, the glenohumeral joint capsule here. Then you have some of your sub, um, uh, your rotator cuff muscles, Supraspinatus is right here, okay? Here's the tendon, it just kind of fuses in with the actual joint cavity. Now it's tough to see, but here you can see, here's the glenoid labrum. So we have the, the uh, glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa is like I said, it's pretty shallow. So again, to try to make it a little bit deeper, we just add in this glenoid labrum. And a lot of people uh, can injure that labrum, they call it a slap tear, that's the most common. Um, type of tear of the glenoid labrum. And so you'll get pain in the shoulder. You'll have some instability going on. All right, so shoulder joint dislocations. So we talked about this before when we were discussing stability versus mobility. So a shoulder dislocation is going to be for the glenohumeral joint. A shoulder separation is going to be for the acromioclavicular joint. Now, these types of injuries are commonly going to happen when you have your arm in the abducted position. All right, so when we have the arm abducted, you're much more likely to having a shoulder separation or a shoulder dislocation. And so when that occurs, when you damage one of those ligaments that I was showing you, the acromioclavicular ligament, for example, then what will happen is you'll see that clavicle move superiorly. So where it used to be nice and um, well, level, you'll get this kind of step drop off like that. And the clavicle moves upwards. And the acromion stays here, doesn't go anywhere but it appears to be more prominent, sticking out. The glenohumeral joint dislocation, common, okay, if you're gonna have an injury to that uh, area there. And again, abduction. So when the arm is in the abducted position, and usually it undergoes some sort of force, okay, it will cause the head of, that hu of the humerus to move out of that little kind of cup-like structure there, and in most cases, the head of the humerus will move forward, it will move anterior, and it drops down. So it's anterior and inferior. That is the common position that you'll see 
for uh, shoulder uh, dislocations. So, um, and it depends on what movie you've seen, right? There's, I've seen, was it Lethal, Lethal Weapon 2 and Mel Gibson would just smash his shoulder into um, a wall and he'd be able to reset it himself. But most commonly there's better uh, positions for that, but I've seen it done in which um, when you wanna uh, set the uh, joints, okay? You have the person lay on their back, you hold on to their uh, wrist, you put your foot in their armpit and you push your foot up into the armpit and you just kind of slightly maneuver the head of the humerus back into the uh, glenoid labrum there. It's quite painful. People have thrown up before when doing it. All right, let's move on to the elbow joint. Okay, our elbow joint is a hinge joint. Okay, flexion and extension. But it's cool because the elbow joint is actually made up of two articulations. Right, you have your humeral ulnar joint. That's the articulation between the humerus and the ulna. Remember the trochlea and the trochlear notch right, that's found in the ulna. That's where we'll see that articulation. And then the other articulation is the humeral, humeral radial joint. Again, that's between the capitulum, that ball at the distal end of the humerus, and the head of the humerus, which looks like a disc with the depression in that disc. And that's where the capitulum sits. Cool thing about it is, all right, both of these joints are in one single articular capsule. So they're together. So you can see, here's the articular capsule. And we learned about an articular capsule. Articular capsule is made up of dense connective tissue, but also you'll have some intrinsic ligaments that help to add on to the articular capsule, okay? So here you'll see in the lateral position, Right, this is the lateral view here, which means that this bone here is the ulna because the ulna is the lateral bone. Right, you can see, right, we have the radial collateral ligament, this fella right here, and that provides, right, or I shouldn't say provides, but that prevents the ulna, right, from moving into uh, adduction. And then we've got this guy, we'll talk more about it, but I wanna point out the annual ligament to you here right now. That's the annular ligament, okay? And that's the ligament that surrounds the head of the radius and the capitulum. And if you've ever heard of nursemaid's elbow, elbow nursemaid's elbow, then you know what I'm gonna talk about here in a few moments. So here up here, we can see flexion and extension of the elbow what that looks like. And then you can see over here on the medial view, you can see the ulnar collateral ligament right here. And so now um, that again will prevent the ulna, okay, from going into abduction. All right, so in case you didn't know, the elbow is a very stable joint for several reasons, okay? One primarily is the thickness of the articular capsule, but also because of how the ulna articulates with the humerus specifically, right? Here you have the trochlea from the side view and then the ulna almost engulfs it. Kind of like that. So it surrounds it pretty well. And so how well did those two articulate pretty much locks in that joint. So again, it's very tough, very tough, right, to cause a dislocation of this joint. And then, of course, we have the articular capsule adding to that, but then we have some extra ligaments in the area. I talked about the radial collateral and the ulna collateral, right? They're going to help to stabilize both of those bones in your forearm. And then we have the annular ligament. This is the one I was telling you about that goes around the head of the radius and the capitulum and it holds, all right, the radius there, okay, into the capitulum. So in a situation, and actually this happened to my brother. Um, that's why I'm the favorite uncle. Because when my niece was very young, I can't remember if she was three or four, 
he and her were walking along and he was holding her hand and she stumbled and fell. And so, of course, he held on to her so she wouldn't go face down, but he didn't let go of her hand. And so as a result of that, he literally pulled the head of the radius right out of the annual ligament. And that's called a nursemaid's elbow. And so, and the reason for this is because at that time, I mean, she was very young, right? The annular ligament is very thin. And the radial head hasn't quite developed that disc-like configuration there. There's a lot of factors involved. So uh, unfortunately, he dislocated her elbow and uh, no big deal, okay? Uh, I came right over there and uh, they told me what happened. And uh, basically all I had to do was shake hands with my niece, grab onto the back of her elbow and uh, pretty much just pop it right back into place. Anyways, doesn't feel good, but at the same time, it saves money on going to the doctor's office to get that put back into place. All right, let's talk about the hip joint on to the lower extremity. We're going to talk about the hip joint, the knee joint, and the ankle joint. Okay, so the hip joint, when we talk about the hip joint, we are discussing the femoral acetabular joint. That is going to be the articulation between the head of the femur and then the cup on the os coxa, in which we call the acetabulum. Well, similar to the glenoid fossa, the acetabulum also has its own belt-like structure. Right, which, which we call the acetabular labrum. Again, it's made of fibral cartilage, okay, and it helps to deepen the socket. Now, the hip joint, the femoral acetabular joint, is much more stable than the glenohumeral joint, okay, and I'll show you why, because one, there's a plethora of muscles down there, tons of ligaments, okay, so unfortunately, it's not going to have as much mobility as the glenohumeral joint, Right, but still, it is a ball and socket joint, so it is highly mobile. So you can see here all the different types of movement that we can get at that joint there. Flexion, extension, abduction, abduction, circumduction. All right, you can get medial rotation, lateral rotation. You get a whole bunch of movements because this is a multi-axial uh, uh, joint here. But if you look closely, you'll notice, okay, that the joint capsule and some of the extrinsic ligaments pretty much attach from the os, under the os coxa all the way to the greater and lesser uh, trochanters of the femur. So pretty much the head and the neck of the femur is completely engulfed inside of the articular capsule here. But we have ligaments all over the place, top, bottom, front, back, they're everywhere. So it's a relatively strong joint, or at least the articular capsule makes it strong. So if we look on the inside here, you can see, look, the neck of the femur and the head is completely engulfed within the articular capsule there. Then you have this ligament here that comes off the head of the femur. We call it the ligament of the head of the femur or the ligamentum teres. Right? This little ligament, it doesn't really offer any stability to the joint, okay? But uh, I talked about it last class. There's a little bit of an indentation on the head of the femur. It's called the fovea or the fovea capitis. And that's where the, head of the, the ligament of the head of the femur will articulate. But there is a blood vessel in here. So if you damage the ligament, you damage the blood vessel, and you can get blood into the joint cavity there. That's never a good thing. We don't like when that happens. All right, so what makes our, our hip joint strong? Well, the capsule itself, the ligaments, and then of course, the muscles there that are going to be part of that. So when we're dealing with the articular capsule, we are gonna completely engulf the head and the neck of the femur. So it's pretty much gonna go from the acetabulum on the os coxa to the lesser and greater trochanters of the femur there. Now there's this other uh, tissue I didn't get a chance to tell you about, called the retinacular fibers, right? And the retinacular fibers are important because we have these guys right there. Arteries, the retinacular arteries reside in the retinacular fibers. Let me show you, here are the retinacular fibers right down here. And basically they're these, these fibers that come off of the articular capsule and they kind of just take a quick turn backwards and, and they um, attach onto the neck of the femur there. So 
if these tissues get damaged, the retinacular arteries get damaged there, okay, they can cause what's known as avascular necrosis. I've talked to you about this before. And so if these arteries are damaged, that avascular necrosis can affect the head and the neck of the femur. And when those tissues start to die, it weakens the bone. You are susceptible to pathological fracture. It's bad, bad news, okay? So that's why it's important, right, that you do not damage those arteries there. All right, so inside the capsule, we have three important ligaments, the iliofemoral ligament, which is going to be found on the anterior side, the ischiofemoral ligament, which is gonna be posterior, and then the pubofemoral ligament, which is gonna be below or inferiorly. All right, so when you move the hip into an extension, you're gonna be pulling on every single one of these ligaments. I already talked about the ligament of the head of the femur, the ligamentum teres. Okay, again, does not provide any strength or stability, but it does have a blood vessel in there. So if you damage that ligament, there's a good chance that you're going to damage that blood vessel, right? And you could risk the possibility of avascular necrosis to the head of the femur. All right, next is the knee joint. I love the knee joint. If you have a very good understanding of the knee joint, you can make yourself very rich because a lot of people have issues with the knee joint. Right? It is the largest of the joints and it is also the most complex, okay? Yes, pretty much it's a hinge joint. Just look at your knee when you bend it and then you straighten it. But, but the, it is capable of having rotation, okay? And we can have some lateral gliding, especially when flexed. But the rotation, I, I, um, I will tell you this, the rotation can still occur when the knee is extended slightly. You have a special mu muscle for this. It's called popliteus. And it's not one of the muscles that you have to know, but that muscle engages when you've locked out your knee. Okay, so it's almost like a screwing in kind of type of configuration. But anyways, when you have the knee bent, you'll see the slight rotation, the lateral gliding much more. When it's extended, you, you really, I mean, in a full extension, you shouldn't see any of that. All right, so there's two types of articulations when we're dealing with the knee joint. You got your tibial femoral joint, and that's going to occur between the femoral condyles of the femur there and the tibia, the tibial condyles, which are the flat surfaces on top of the tibia. The tibia is the larger of the two bones in your leg, right? It's the weight-bearing bone. It's the medial bone. And then we have another articulation, and that's the patellofemoral joint. And that's going to be your kneecap, where your kneecap is going to articulate with the anterior surface of the femur there. So here you can see a picture of the anterior and posterior views. Right, you can see, look at the knee joint. Look at all of those different tissues all around. And we'll talk about them. Okay, so quite a bit of, of ligaments, both intrinsic ligaments, which are part of the, uh, the articular capsule, and then we have our extrinsic ligaments, those are the named ligaments there. And you can see now we're looking in the knee when it's bent right through the front. I'm sure you've heard of these ligaments here, the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament, commonly injured. And then from the posterior view, you can definitely see the posterior cruciate ligament very well much easier to see. All right, we'll hit all these. I'm gonna go back and forth and back and forth. Oh, here's some of our good friends here. Look at this, the menisci. We have a lateral and medial meniscus. Remember the, those fibrocartilaginous um, shock absorbing cushions in your knee? Well, there they are. All right, so let's talk about some of the structures here. We're going to start off with the articular capsule. Notice that you'll only see the articular capsule of the knee on the sides of the knee and then the back of the knee. You don't see it in the front. Okay, in the front, we've got this tendon, the quadriceps femoris tendon sitting in the front. Also, you'll have the patella embedded into that tendon there. And then where that tendon extends from the patella down to the tibia, we call that the patellar ligament. Remember, a ligament attaches bone to bone, a tendon attaches muscle to bone. Well, technically this, the, um, the patella is a sesamoid bone. So it resides inside of a tendon. 
So let's talk about some of the ligaments. We talked about the patellar ligament. Now we're gonna learn about some of the ligaments on the sides and the inside of the knee joint. The first one here is the fibril, excuse me, not fibril, fibular collateral ligament. Now you'll have to forgive me because I so badly wanna call it the lateral collateral ligament because that's what it used to be called, all right? It's still called that. Um, not too many people that I know refer to it as the uh, fibular collateral ligament, but it's just easier to remember fibular collateral ligament because you know that the fibula is on the lateral portion of your leg. So we'll see the fibular collateral ligament on the lateral surface of the joint, and its job is to prevent hyperadduction, right? That basically means it prevents your ankle or the uh, distal portion of your leg bending inwards. If we look here, here's the fibular, uh, fibular collateral ligament right here, right there. All right, that's the fibular collateral ligament. Then we have the tibial collateral ligament, also known as the medial collateral ligament. So we'll find it on the medial portion of the joint, right? And it's going to prevent hyperabduction. So excessive right, bending away or bowleggedness. All right, that's going to be in the medial portion there. All right, so also on the inside, I mentioned the medial and lateral meniscus. Those are the fibrocartilaginous uh, pads there that you'll see that sit on top of the tibia, right? And so it, what's its job? Its job is to help to stabilize the joint and offer cushioning, all right? So it helps to resist compression there. Now, something you should know is you'll see, here's the medial meniscus. And then you'll have the tibial collateral ligament right here. Okay. Now, if you look at the tibial collateral ligaments and the fibular collateral ligaments, the fibular collateral ligament only goes from the femur down to the fibula. Whereas the tibial collateral ligament, right, it is going to travel from the femur down to the tibia but it also attaches to the medial meniscus. That's why when you have an injury, and I'll talk about it in a second, you'll usually have, if the medial meniscus gets injured, usually the tibial collateral ligament is injured also, and vice versa. And right, then we have our cruciate ligaments. Those are those ligaments that sit on the inside of your knee. Okay, so they're deep to the articular capsule. They cross over. That's why we call them cruciate. Right, and you have the anterior cruciate ligament. And so this ligament is going to also help to prevent hyperextension, so you don't overextend your knee, but also it prevents your knee from sliding forward. So if I were to have you bend your knee and I start to pull, right, and push on your tibia, right, this ligament helps to prevent me pulling your tibia forward on your femur. So then conversely, when I'm trying to look at the posterior cruciate ligament, it helps to prevent hyperflexion, but also it prevents posterior movement of the tibia. So if I push on the tibia and I try to push it backwards on the femur, it will resist that. So that leads me to a whole slew of injuries here. We've got our um, uh, knee ligament and cartilage injuries. So the tibial collateral ligament, that's going to be the ligament that's medially. So usually we'll see that get injured during forced abduction. The fibular collateral ligament, that's on the lateral side. Okay, so if your leg is struck on the medial side, it'll bend the knee outward and it'll stress the fibular collateral ligament. Okay. ACL and PCL, ACL is injured when you hyperextend the knee. PCL is injured when you hyperflex the knee. 
most likely with a meniscus injury, it's usually going to be trauma. Overuse, yes, okay, and if it's repetitive, in, incorrect, or inappropriate overuse, that will definitely destroy the meniscus. Now, there's this term here called the unhappy triad. This is a pretty frequently seen injury, especially in football. You have three structures that get injured. You get the medial meniscus, the ACL, and the tibial collateral ligament, also known as the medial collateral ligament. And this usually happens when a guy is running on the football field and someone goes to tackle him and hits him on the lateral side of the knee. And so when that occurs, you get abduction of the knee and it pretty much just, uh, it can tear the tibial collateral ligament and the tibial collateral ligament is attached to the medial meniscus. So it causes the medial meniscus um, to get damaged in addition to the uh, medial condyle smashing down onto uh, the meniscus. And then the ACL, uh, because of where it's attached onto uh, the tibia and the femur will also tear. All right, the last joint that I wanna to talk to you about is the talocrural joint. This is your ankle joint, okay? Again, it is a hinge joint, but it's special, okay? Because it has dorsiflexion and plantar flexion that occur. Again, we've got another joint in which there are two articulations that are gonna be found inside of one capsule. You have the articulation between the tibia and the talus, which is the first tarsal bone in your foot. And then you also have an articulation between the fibula and the talus. So here you can see, all right, there's plantar flexion and, and dorsiflexion there at the top of the page there. You see what that looks like. And our lateral view here, you see there's a couple ligaments here. This one here, these lateral uh, ligaments and that one there. All right, that's the only two ligaments that you can, re well, I take that back on this one. Those three ligaments, all right, help to stabilize that joint laterally. Now compare those three ligaments to these three ligaments. Much thicker, right, on the medial side. Okay, all of that we call the deltoid ligament. That's another reason why you'll see more ankle inversion uh, strains than you are sprains, and then you will <clears throat> eversion. Look at all these ligaments here on the medial side, and there's only a couple there, and they're small on the lateral side. So that's another reason why you see that. All right, let's finish up and talk about development and aging of the joints. Your joints start to develop at week six. So as you start to take on that humanoid form, and we talked about how we build up a cartilage model first in the fetal skeleton, and then we transition and, and, and change it over into uh, uh, bone tissue, okay? So what we're seeing here is we're gonna start to see these joints start to form at week six. And as um, when we're talking about the fibrous joints, all right, the mesenchyme, okay? You remember mesenchyme is gonna be that embryological stem cell tissue, all right, that all connective tissue comes from. Okay, so the mesenchyme for fibrous joints is gonna, change into that dense regular connective tissue because fibrous joints are joined or joints that are that join two bones together with dense regular connective tissue. Our cartilaginous joints, that mesenchyme is going to change into fibrocartilage or hyaline cartilage. And then for our synovial joints, it's interesting. The mesenchyme that's lateral, right, will turn into the articular capsule and then some of those ligaments. Then the next layer in, all right, that mesenchyme will turn into the synovial membrane. And then the centrally located mesenchyme in the center has two options. It can either be resorbed, all right, and that will then give us a, a, a joint cavity, or it can form menisci or those articular discs that we've seen in some of those joints. That's pretty cool. Has those options there. All right, then finally, I wanna talk about the aging of the joints. You've heard of the big A, the arthritis. These are arthritic conditions, all right, that can occur to joints. It can either be a rheumatic disease and that usually involves damage to the articular cartilage, all right? Or it can be osteoarthritic in nature and that's usually a wear and tear type of damage. 
that occurs. Both will have swelling and inflammation. I'll talk about that in a second. That's why it is important, and I say this all the time to folks, you know, when we're talking about the health benefits of exercises on joints, remember, mature cartilage is avascular, okay? And so synovial fluid provides the nutrients and helps to take away the wastes from the chondrocytes in the articular cartilage there, right? But what we need to do is we need to circulate that synovial fluid. How do we do that? We move around. And when we move around through exercise and movement, we increase the flow of synovial fluid. That's why if you've ever received a cell phone, excuse me, uh, uh, email from me from my cell phone, I always respond and my signature motion is life, never stop moving. And that's why. Now you know the secret to my cell phone email messages. Okay. Also, Obviously, exercise will strengthen muscles, and we know that muscles will help to support and stabilize joints. So it's wonderful. Last slide here, the different types of arthritis, right? When we're talking about arthritis, it is a group of inflammatory or degenerative diseases when we're dealing with joints. So if we have inflammation, we'll have swelling. And if we have degeneration, all right, we will have tissue damage that will cause pain. And as a result of that, we will get stiffness. Long standing inflammation. This is not made up, this is actual fact, right? Long standing inflammation in joints can cause tissue damage. Long term tissue damage causes degeneration. So there's three types of arthritis I want to talk to you about. Gaudia, gouty arthritis, the gout, someone said to me. I've got the gout. That means their body has high levels of uric acid. Uric acid is a cellular waste, all right? And normally you can get rid of it the normal way that you get rid of uh, certain cellular waste. It gets filtered out and goes away into your pee. Well, in this case, these people have increased levels of uric acid. That uric acid transitions and changes into crystals. And these crystals will deposit themselves inside the joints. So it's like having gravel in your shoe. It's much more painful than that, okay, for those of you that have had gout. But those crystals deposit into the joint, and then you start walking or moving on those joints, and it causes significant amount of pain. Osteoarthritis, this is the old age uh, arthritis, right? You'll see it in much older individuals. This is the wear and tear. So we've worn down the articular cartilage on these, on these bones and these joints. And so you'll see this type of arthritis in areas of either weight bearing or lots of activity or use. So fingers, knuckles, knees and hips, shoulders will all be uh, those joints. And even in the spine that people will complain of osteoarthritis. I wouldn't know, but I've heard gout is really bad. There's a condition in gout called podagra, and that's when uh, usually the, the big toe is the one that um, gets affected by gout in a lot of folks. It is so bad that patients that have the podagra can't even put a bed sheet on their toe. That's how, sens how sensitive it is. Okay, so Rebecca knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, for gout, you really want to limit anything that will dehydrate you. So stay away from coffee and sodas and all that. You don't want to eat uh, lunch meat, anything with uh, preservatives in it or um, uh, um, nitrites. Okay, so lunch and meat, you stay away from, drink lots of water. Yeah, red meat too. Yep, yep. Last type of arthritis is RA, rheumatoid arthritis. This is the one that you're going to see in younger people. Right? When I say younger people, middle age, but you can also see it in young, uh, young adults also. All right? Unfortunately, it's autoimmune. So guess what? That means seeing women more often. And basically what will happen is you get what's called panis formation. And what the panis formation is, the synovial membrane becomes inflamed. And of course, that creates swelling. It creates... Uh, uh, pain, all sorts of different things, right? But that is the rheumatoid arthritis. All right, folks. Sorry that we started off a little bit late there today, but